Uh, be here. Uh, be committed. I'm cutting it 30 minutes short, so you can commit me to three hours. All right, and I'll make sure that I'm prepared for boot camp. Get it on time. Make sure that it, that it is working well. Come focused, ready to learn. I'm not going to be ready to deal with, with some of our, our Saturday distractions that, that in the second session we just don't have time for. All right? So be here ready to go, and we'll take care of our business, and I promise it'll be worth your while. We'll do some multiple choice questions to frame some of our review. We'll do some short answer questions to frame some of our review. So we're anchoring our review in things that, that I would expect for you to know. So today we're going to talk about the things that we couldn't quite finish on Monday that lead us directly into uh, a lot of our issues for tomorrow. Tomorrow is a big, big day. Uh, by tomorrow, we will tank the entire U.S. economy. By tomorrow, everybody will be broke. We'll talk about people killing themselves over jobs lost. By tomorrow, we'll talk about all kinds of wild, like crazy poverty because of the Great Depression. Uh, but today, everything is phenomenal. Today, everything is shiny. Today, everything is great. Today, we'll talk about how lovely things look on the very top of society because in the 1920s, things look really shiny on the top. Huh. When have we heard that before? Things look really shiny on the top. Yeah, good. I like it, guys. Thank you for the energy. Thank you for the response. So talking about some of the characteristics of the Gilded Age. What do we talk about in the Gilded Age? I know it's a little quick period six review. What are some of the characteristics of the Gilded Age? Big picture. Yeah, industrialization. Yeah, good. Big business. Good. What else? Political corruption. Good. Good. Good job, Dwayne. Why gap between rich and poor? Political corruption. Good. Corruption. What does the government do about business or the Gilded Age? What's it called? Laissez faire. Laissez -faire. Good. 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 So what we see in the 1920s is all of this gets repeated. Which is funny, because what's the era right before the 1920s called? And all this stuff kind of got stopped, did it not? Yeah. We go through this whole time period of trying to address these problems. Right? If I did it like on a, on a graph, you'd see like all those problems are increasing in the Gilded Age. What happens in the Progressive Era? They drop. In the 1920s, we go right back to it. This is my point about how society in America is always a pendulum. Construction craziness, Progressive, 1920s. Reconstruction is a great example. Rights for African Americans, never mind. Jim Crow South, Plessy versus Ferguson. All right, it's just kind of the way it works. And here, up here, it's kind of cool if you guys like. Uh, I don't know how much you like your graphs. Oh, from from Ms. Rose class. I don't know how much you like tables too, right? Eat at tables. Gilded Age, Progressive Era. We see a decline in these negative uh, aspects in the 1920s. Cool. But just like the Gilded Age of the 1920s, everything looks even better on the surface. Because in the Gilded Age, like, there still is a ton of like, really, really, really bad poverty. We see the like, immigration, living situations, tenement housing, political machines, all this terribleness. But in the 1920s, like, even more people are being successful. So it isn't just a little layer and then terrible. The 1920s, like, it, it actually is pretty good. It's not just the surface, it's deeper than just the surface. The US is the richest country in the world. Why? We're not destroyed by World War I. We're not ruined economically and ruined uh, material-wise by World War I. We are the most developed country in the world. As I talked about in World War I, now people owe us money. We're the big dog in the world. We are a lender country, not a debtor country. We see wages going up. People are making more money at, at all classes. Hours are less. Working conditions are better. People are doing well. People are doing really well. People have access to new goods. And I, like I told you guys at the very tail end of Monday, what are people, what's the big uh, industrial developments of the Gilded Age? Railroads, what else? Steel, good. Iron, coal. Yeah, but, but in general, these are, are these things people actually buy for their houses? No. I don't, you don't buy a freaking railroad for your house. Man, I got a good bonus of work, I'm gonna go buy a steel beam. Mm. <laughs> But in the 1920s, this is fueled by household goods. People are buying stuff not because they need them, but because they want them. So really, what I want you guys to, to look at the 1920s as is the exclamation point on the Gilded Age. Think about it that way. That the 1920s are the nice, because exclamation points imply what? E excitement, happiness, yeah. So the 1920s are the exclamation point to the Gilded Age. When, when all this crazy industrialism actually impacts people's daily lives, people's daily experiences. Uh, 
because it's finally hitting things that are consumer durable goods. Appliances, washing machines, ovens, stoves, refrigerators, vacuum cleaners. Cars, huge in the 1920s. Everybody's buying cars. Radios, furniture, clothing. And a lot of all of, of this stuff is being fueled by electricity. A big development that really hits home in the 1920s is household power that is not uh, oil-based. You're not lighting lamps in your house anymore. You're turning on a light switch. And with electricity, it means we can plug our refrigerators in. What? It used to be just an ice box. Literally a box with ice where you put your refrigerated things in. Right? That's why it's called an ice box. Um, electricity in the home, electricity in the workplace. And big picture, what happens in the 1920s is the middle class grows. That's a big thing that I want you to know in the 1920s, is, is our, these big corporations, like we've always had, are using salaried executives. So people in this middle class, uh, plant managers that are managing uh, industrial uh, factories and plants, engineers, as, as we try to, like in the Gilded Age, increase efficiency. What is the process of increased efficiency called in the Gilded Age? Increased efficiency, what's it called? The efficiency or efficiency? Efficiency. Oh. Do you know what it's called? Oh, Talk to me. Yeah, scientific management. Yeah, Taylorism. Good. Yeah, so this idea of, of, of taking a scientific approach to, to production, what's it called in the 20s? Fordism. Yeah, because it's, it's Ford. That's really the, one of the big, big things to talk about in the 1920s is the assembly line. Yeah, the Model T, right? By, by making it really easy to assemble cars, cars get cheaper. Fordism of just producing as many as possible to reduce costs uh, is, this, is this huge growth in the middle class. So we still see like the Gilded Age, the ownership class up top, the working class at the bottom, but we still have this really big growing middle class of management. And in this management class, we see extra money because they're making more money than they need just to live on. And that extra money leads to fun opportunities, leisure opportunities, people are going to the movies, people are going to sporting events. This big, what we call it in the Gilded Age, if you guys remember the urbanization chapter, it was called conspicuous consumption. But that was just the top of society. Now this idea of consumption, of buying things that you want, not that you need, buying things for entertainment, going out to eat, going out to enjoy yourself, it's going to trickle all the way down to the middle class. And this middle class gets significantly larger uh, because of all the businesses that are selling all the stuff to all the people in the 1920s, until it all falls apart. But I'll get to that today too. Not just that, but there's a huge increase in name brands. Look at your outfit right now. Every one of you in here is probably wearing a name brand something. Name brand shoes. Yeah, Disney's a name brand. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but it's a Nike Laker shirt, you got a Nike sweatshirt, uh, Vans, Converse, Adidas, Nike, Champion, sure. Uh, and it's, it's in the 1920s, Rubia, it's in the 1920s that we start seeing national name brands, not just on clothing, but on appliances, on food, on radio shows, where you can listen to the same radio show in Texas that you can listen to in New York. So we're gonna interconnect our culture more than ever before. Our, our world's gonna shrink, not technology-wise, it is that too, but it's gonna shrink culturally. Where now you can buy the same types of things wherever you are in America. And a lot of that is driven by appliances. Uh, I know some of the men in the room are excited about this because you, know, you like to pretend that this is the way the world's supposed to work. Uh, but we have two examples up here uh, of a brand new uh, stove that has a stove and an oven and like a, what we consider now like a microwave. Um, but there's this idea of consumerism leads to people buying luxury goods at the time. Now you wouldn't consider these things luxury goods, but in the 1920s, a refrigerator is a luxury good. A nice brand new oven and stove is a luxury good. A vacuum cleaner or a washing machine for your clothes is a luxury good. So now, the, for the most part, despite these flappers that are living outside the house and doing their own thing, most women still live at home, married, and do domestic work, but this domestic work becomes easier because these new appliances make their jobs easier. Now you don't need to go outside and wash your clothes in the wash bin, you just put it in the washing machine. 
Right? You're going to go and chop wood for your stove? You have a gas stove. It's wild. Right? But looking at, are, are these things advertised as needs? How are they advertised? As wants. So what do both of these ads tell us? There's a huge new growth of advertising in American society. That now businesses are trying to reach people by appealing to their wants. Like here is this stove, look. Perfect baking, here's the secret. Make cooking easy. Look at this awesome refrigerator. Make entertaining a simple, joyous job. So advertisement is the thing that ties all of this together. It gets a lot of people in trouble. Because you're starting to ask people, don't you want this? Not don't you need this? Right, so we start seeing this, this, this competition in the world, right? Well, my neighbor has a new fridge, I want a new fridge. Right? The woman down the street has a new stove, I want a new stove. Right? Like you guys, trying to flex on people with your stove or your fridge. Uh, but look at this brand, General Electric. Anybody ever heard of it? Yeah. Yeah, I guarantee you right now, a third of you in this room, if you go home, uh, you'll either have a General Electric fridge, stove, or microwave. Go home and look. Report back. Take a picture. Yeah, correct. Um, they, got, they got General Electric there. Just a little knockoff. <laughs> they still don't, they still generally just want to eat, right? Um, but it's a it's a name brand that we still see in today's society of of appliance, right? Make cooking easy. Other advertisements. Look at Listerine. Who's heard of Listerine? Yeah. Huh? How, how's your breath today? It's a phenomenal advertisement. How's your breath today? If it's bad, you won't be welcome. Play safe, use Listerine, right? But advertising to this idea of the culture of the 20s, of going out to enjoy yourself, to be a little bit promiscuous, to get yourself in a little bit of trouble, but do so with Listerine, you're good to go. Uh, Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth, uh, advertising soda, cola. It's the finest cola drink I ever tasted. There's his face, buy Coca-Cola, why? Because Babe Ruth likes it. Right? This is consumerism society, buying things because you want them, not because you need them. One of my personal favorites, uh, the idea of having an athlete advertising or sponsoring by cigarettes. Because you would never see that today. I heard LeBron James right? smoke Marlboro Reds. Yes? Is this like Kanye West or the t-shirts that are just all hype? Yeah, sure. Like, but like, how, think about yourself right now. How many of you guys have been inspired to buy something because a celebrity endorsed it? Don't lie. So the, the lip plumping? Yeah, bro, I see that. It's, wor it's working. Getting it. Uh, but think about it. Like basketball shoes. Yeezys. Right? Like, it, uh, my point is, like, so much of our society today is built on what celebrities wear, what's, what celebrities say is cool, and that begins in the 1920s with Babe Ruth advertising cigarettes and soda. And he's like, yeah, I'm a fat baseball player, who cares? So they home runs and I smoke a pack around the bases. Uh, uh, but I'm sorry about the white palm, but also radio. Right? NBC, you guys heard of NBC? Yeah. yeah. Right, today, Channel 4. Uh, NBC, <laughs> the British broadhead. Uh, NBC becomes the first successful radio network. And, they're, and they're, they're playing radio shows, you can listen to the news, you can listen to like, dramas and stories on the radio, and it's crazy. And it's not just that, but also movie theaters as well. Movie theaters as well. A uh, hundred million Americans go to the movies every week in the 1920s. A hundred million Americans go to the movies every, it's the, by the end of the 20s, the chief form of, of public entertainment consumption. But it's not just that, it's baseball games, it's boxing events, it's a, it's a more consumer-driven, want-driven, I want to enjoy myself-driven society in a way that America has never been able to do. Here's Char for Charlie Chaplin, for example. He's a super famous uh, actor, largely in the silent movies. Uh, very famous. Uh, he used to have a cool mustache until Hitler took the idea. <laughs> now you can't, can't quite pull that off anymore. <laughs> like, it's just a Charlie Chaplin. Nah, bro, that's Hitler. Oh, <laughs> Yeah, that's what it was called in the 20s, though, and the 30s. Was that kind of like short, not all the way across mustache? was called a Charlie Chaplin until that like Adolf took it over, and yeah, that's kind of how it works. Really Just like you can't name your kid Adolf anymore, right? <laughs> that was a popular name in the 30s, and everyone's like, damn. 
<laughs> but imagine being born in 1935, parents are like, oh, we're going to call you Adolf. That's a cool name, right? And by 1952, everyone's like, man, screw that guy. <laughs> what did I do? Uh, but the jazz singer is a good example of the first, it's called a talkie or a movie with audio. Uh, not so much even that, just the first uh, movie that even had sound. The rest of the movies are all silent. So the 20s consumer society is really driven on, on buying things, enjoying things, doing things because you want to. So again, on the surface, it all looks really, 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 really good. Everything is happy, everything is prosperous, but there is a lot of weakness underneath this that should have tipped us off. Are we gonna get tipped off? No. What does America do when there's underlying economic problems? We ignore them. <laughs> what do we do when uh, there starts to be more competition and our prices drop? What do we always do? We make more. We produce more. That's a good idea, always. It never backfires. Except in 1837, 1857, 1873, 1893, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 1993, yeah? Sure. So, uh, three, of our, three of our biggest American industries start to suffer. And we're going to ignore the red flag. That's the big key. Railroads start to suffer. Cotton starts to suffer. Coal starts to suffer. And these are three industries that have operated without what for much of their existence? Government. Without competition. So railroads start to see competition from what? Cars. And then planes. It's not the only way to transport things anymore. Boats. Boats have kind of always existed. <laughs> right, since, 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 since Noah built the first one. Exactly, that's a big ass boat. Uh, Cotton starts to suffer uh, because of post-World War I, we see an increase in imperialism from places like England, places like France. Um, and we start seeing new advances in uh, different kinds of cloth. So, yeah, polyester, not, so cotton's not the only thing anymore, so that's competition. And coal starts to suffer because of competition from what? Gas. Yeah. Gas, electricity. electricity, yeah, absolutely. So the problem is, arguably, three of the biggest industries in America start to decline a little bit, and that should have been a red flag. We ignore it. Farming is arguably America's biggest business all combined, and farmers are killing it during World War I. Farmers are making an absolute killing. Why? They're feeding the soldiers. Who else are we feeding? The rest of the world. Remember that huge increase in trade I showed you on the World War I day? Like, no, that's not all military stuff, that's food stuff. We're feeding France because France is too busy fighting a war to grow crops. We're feeding England, we're, fe we're feeding Europe what happens after the war. We don't, feed them we don't need to feed them anymore. Europe can feed themselves. So the problem is, when we get used to make, remember back to uh, Brett's farm? We talked about yeah. during uh, the populace. When we get, Brett's corn farm, yeah. When we, when we get used to making a bunch of money, and then that money's not there anymore, what's our solution? Always. Make more. Make more. more Overproduce. So our farmers are killing it during World War I, and all of a sudden after the war, demand decreases. And when demand decreases, what should you do with your supply? Lower your supply. Of, of course, as you guys know, this is the American way. Why should I lower my supply? I'm going to just produce more and more and more. And there's a good argument to be made that actually, uh, for the farmers, their Great Depression starts in the early 20s. It's the rest of America that has the Great Depression in the 30s. The farmers get a 10-year head start on the Great Depression. But look at their income. Most The farm average income during the 20s is 273 bucks a year. The rest of America is making 700 bucks a year. So farmers are making about a third of what the rest of America is making during the 20s which goes to show that actually uh, farms are the beginning of the Great Depression and it starts earlier. Because what do farmers also need and buy? Goods. So when they stop buying stuff, who else become, becomes by nature overproducing? Every other manufacturing. Consumer goods, appliances. So when the farmers aren't making money, they aren't buying stuff because they were overproducing. Other, like Ford is going to be producing, General Electric is to be producing, but all of a sudden we, everybody's producing too much and the entire thing collapses in on itself. Now the big takeaway though that makes the 20s different 
is a couple things. One, urbanization. The 20s, like I told you guys on Monday, is the first decade where more Americans live in cities than on farms. It's the first decade where we are a more urban society than a rural society. But the second big takeaway is how we're paying for all this stuff. Brett wants a new radio. What does Brett do? He buys a new radio. Hostway wants a new vacuum cleaner. What does Hostway do? He buys a damn vacuum cleaner. No way wants a new Model T. You can barely see over the steering wheel, but he's going to drive. Uh, what, what does No way do? He buys a car. Hell yeah. Chris wants a refrigerator. What does Chris do? He buys a refrigerator. But so much of the 1920s is built on a four-word slogan. Buy now, Buy now, or enjoy now, or have now, pay later. And that's okay. Hear me out. I have to buy a new car this weekend. My lease is up. I got to turn my car in. I got to buy a new car this weekend. Do I have uh, tens of thousands of dollars just sitting around to go buy a car? No, I don't. I just bought a house. Same thing. I got to pay for that every month. But I don't have a bunch of money. I'm not Ms. Moreau over here just swinging out on Teslas. Uh, I don't have a bunch of money uh, to just buy a car. So in a sense, I'm going to buy a car on credit. Hear me out. So I'm going to buy a car, and then every month I'm going to pay about 400 bucks, and then I'm going to have my car. You with me? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? It builds credit. Sure, it's a good thing. Uh, why is it a good thing? You don't have to pay it off. You don't have to pay it off. You don't have to pay it off. So pay it what do I have to show for it? No. I have a car. Now I can drive my car. You with me so far? So I just bought a car on credit. Buy now and then pay monthly. And that's okay for the most part because I can afford the monthly payments and I need a car. What other things are we buying on credit in the 1920s? Appliances. Appliances, yeah. Have this fridge now, pay for it. Is that okay? Yeah, why? Because you have an appliance to show for it. But the big problem is buying stocks. Uh, it's not called credit, it's called buying it on margin. Now, I went through a whole explanation of the stock market after school on a Thursday during the Gilded Age. I will do it again tomorrow. And I'll use more examples about how that deals with the stock market crash. So my strong, my strong suggestion for you is if you're confused at all in the stock market and how this works, come tomorrow. First thing I'll do is I'll do a whole diagram of the stock market and how it works. But let's talk about buying on margin. What is a stock and its very foundational idea? It's a tiny piece of a company. A tiny sliver of ownership of a company. Pick a company. Whatever company you got. Coca-Cola. General Electric. So Brett, Brett buys a stock in General Electric. Now what does he own? Guys, anybody else want to speak up? A tiny sliver of General Electric. But Brett does not buy that stock with money. He buys that stock on margin. Buy now, pay later. You with me? Now what happens if General Electric goes bankrupt? What does Brett have to show for? Nothing. Nothing. As opposed to my car, or I'm buying on a credit, but at least I have a car. He's buying a stock on margin on the hopes that that company increases in value and now his stock is worth more and he can pay off buy now, pay later. The equivalent to this would be if I bought my car this weekend on credit. I drove off with a lot and I drove my ass right into a tree. And I didn't have insurance. Now what? Do I still have to pay for that car? Yeah. Yes. Do I have a car? Do I have a car to show for it? Yeah. No, because I drove it into a tree and I, I, I wrecked it. So the problem becomes when you're buying. So the stock market gets super inflated. Every, everything is uh, everything's worth so much money. We're just buying stocks on margin. Ton of inflation. But this pay later idea means that even when the stock market collapses, we still got to pay for it. And maybe the stock market is overinflated than its actual value because you're letting anybody and their mother buy stock on margin, which artificially inflates what things are worth because there's more demand than there should be. Next thing you know, everybody, literally, and their mother, there's a good documentary I can show you guys at some point if you want. Uh, this lady's like, everybody was in the stock market. Like our housekeeper was buying stocks, right? Our maid was buying stocks, right? Because like, they're all just buying it on margin on the hopes that it keeps increasing. So everybody's buying things on credit, consumer goods on credit, buying stocks on a margin. It's all this whole theory of buy now, pay later, but eventually you got to pay. And all of this is driven by advertising. Don't you want this new car? Don't you want this new radio? You know what you really need? You really need a new stove. 
And everyone's like, damn right. I do need a new stove. Like, that's me and my wife. Like, honey, you just bought a new whatever three months ago, but I need a new one now. Credit. If you guys want, after the AP test, I'll give you a whole lesson if you guys want on credit and how it works and, and why it's important and all these things. Uh, I know, somebody in first room was like, Cerna taught us in YBA. I'm like, cool. <laughs> Excellent. Good for him. When Cerna needs financial advice, where does he go? <laughs> yeah, of course. So all of this is the economy of the 20s, and it's all wrapped up in advertising and keeping up. Uh, uh, now, from a societal factor, the last th thing I, I missed on Monday is called the lost generation. Now, that's what you should know, this lost generation. That we have this new class of intellectuals, artists, poets, playwrights, people, um, who are critical, this might sound familiar, I want, I want this to sound familiar, who are critical of American industrialism and American materialism. And they're criticizing America for being too wrapped up in the way things look. Who else was critical of America being too wrapped up in the way things look? European. Louder. The transcendentalists. Right? Thoreau and Walden are like, America, like, go inside for satisfaction. Stop looking to the rest of the industrialized world to drive what makes you happy. So this lost generation is very pessimistic, very negative, very dark. Less about happiness and yay, you know, the world is a beautiful place. And more about like, damn, this country sucks. So a bunch of good examples that I won't get too far into. But just know that the 1920s are characterized by a darker sense of literature, a more critical assessment of America. Um, you guys have all read Gatsby. Yeah. It's a great example of, of criticizing America being too wrapped up in material goods. Anybody read Catcher on the Rye? Yeah. Yeah, yeah same idea. Same idea that there's this big internal struggle between outer satisfaction and what, what should be happening in life. <laughs> good examples. Uh, Main Street is written by Sinclair Lewis, and it criticizes small town America being too narrow minded. That whole. Uh, Modernism versus uh, traditionalism uh, conflict. Gatsby, of course, is great. Um, a lot of the plays in the 20s are very tragic. Uh, people like believing in great things and being let down, much like America at the time. Uh, but overall, the 20s are a big decade of change. Right? Economically, I want you to know there's a ton of prosperity, there's a ton of consumer goods, but it's all bought on credit. Socially, Right? The Red Scare, we're scared of immigrants, we're scared of communists, we're scared of labor unions, we're scared, of, so we're passing these like Origins Act, Emergency Quota Act, we're scared, scared of strikes. Politically speaking, very pro-business, very Republican like we have in the Gilded Age. Uh, there's a ton of growth of technology as well, cars, planes, all that fun stuff. So overall, uh, it's, a, it's a decade, big time though, of change, and it's all change that, that leads us into a much more modern, Americanized, quote unquote, society. We're in good shape. Consumerism, government policies are going to favor business, favor isolationism. Uh, women and African Americans make a ton of progress. The flappers and the Harlem Renaissance, but immigrants take a huge L in the 1920s. So do labor unions, and then the idea of cars, radios, entertainment, all all kind of evolving into a place in society. So that wraps up some of the big themes that I wanted to get to on Monday and couldn't quite. I apologize. Um, but from a social, not going to finish anyway. Uh, from a social, cultural standpoint, economic standpoint, these ideas of consumerism matter. These ideas of, of nativism matter. Uh, looking at the 20s through this lens of a decade of change. Now let's talk politics. I'm going to refer you back to the Gilded Age. Which party is largely in charge of the Gilded Age? Republicans. Republicans. And what kind of policies do they put in place? Uh, oh, big, big biz. Yeah, pro biz. What kind? What kind of stuff? Tariffs, anti-regulation, anti-involvement uh, in business, uh, let business do business. And the 1920s are going to be that on steroids. It's almost like the progressive era never happened. We see, uh, and much, ooh, fun fact, bless you, I'll do that again. Much like the Gilded Age, these presidents are very forgettable. Very forgettable. We have three Republicans in power. Uh, through the 1920s, it's an era of, it's kind of the last era of Republican uh, regime power. And I'm going to talk about all of them. But big picture, this should not be surprising. They're going to do everything they can to limit the progress of progressives. Oh, you, don't, you like having things like labor union power? Not anymore. You like seeing things like regulating businesses? Not anymore. There's going to be very close relationship. Government and business are going to work very, very close, hand in hand. What are the two best ways? The government and business can work together. 
What's up? What can government do to support business, so to speak? What can they run? Tariffs and uh, T word? Tax cuts. Tax cuts. Tax cuts. The cutting taxes. Pay less taxes, pay less taxes, pay less taxes. Tariffs and tax cuts. We had the first income tax in the, guild, in the progressive era, and we're going to really cut that back. Cool? And we're going to try to get ourselves more economically involved than the rest of the world. Now that the rest of the world owes us money. That's going to bite us in the ass as well. So on the back of, of your page, I just have the three presidents and the three elections to talk about. That's all we got. Um, and the first is 1920. So the first, look at the map. What, is it, what does the map resemble? What do we see in the election map? Uh, section, section, very, very sectional. Yeah, very, very sectional. The Republicans are, are controlling the west and the, the southwest and the north and the middle of the country. Democrats largely still in the south. The Democrats run a, a dude named James Cox. Yeah. You ever heard of him? Yeah. No. You have? Please tell us more. That's all, I just heard his name. He says it all the time. Okay. You know his name? Yeah, because I just said it. <laughs> I would have, that's a different book if you should write a Yeah, that's a different book. It's a graphic novel. Oh, and, and Republicans run the original Warren G. Warren G. Harding. <laughs> it's a big regulator. <laughs> Thank you, I'm glad. Right, I've, been, I've been saying that Warren G. Harding was the original Warren G. since my first year teaching here. And my first year, like a lot of people laughed. And then I feel older and older and older because every year we get farther away from Warren G. mattering in the rap game. And then everyone's like, <laughs> Warren G. Right, Warren G. is the man. All right, if you disagree, I will fight you. Oh, right. um, who is that? Exactly. <laughs> who, who do you listen to? <laughs> Next question, who listens to you? Nobody. Now, uh, Warren G. Harding, his whole platform, his whole platform is a return to normalcy. Stay with me for a second. Warren G. Harding, a return to normalcy. Does that sound like a progressive platform or a traditional type of platform? Yeah, he's like, he's like forget all this change stuff. Progressive era, that sucked. Big government, that sucked. World War I, that sucked. Let's go back to the way things used to be. Kind of like TAP, but at least TAP is like breaking up trust, pushing for amendments. Much more so like a Andrew Johnson. All right, once Lincoln died, all these ideas like to, to help black people, was like, let's just go back to the way things were. Remember he said that the, the Constitution as it is? Yeah, right, society as it was. Um, a return to normalcy. My, my big problem with this is I don't even think normalcy is a word. Uh, he made up this word for his campaign slogan. A return to normalcy. And does, does, does America agree? Yep. Yeah, America agrees strongly. Now, of course, our friend Eugene Debs, he of that awesome speech you guys read last week. How come everybody criticizes the government they're a hero? I criticize the government you guys throw me in jail. He runs for president from jail. He's still locked up on the Espionage and Sedition Act, anti-World War I speech. He's locked up, and he gets a million votes. That's a G move. Running for president. For, and how many years did they give him? They gave him a 10-year sentence in 1918. It's only 1920. He's only been here for two years, and he's like, vote for me. Like, I know I'm about to be in jail for the next eight years, right? Like, that dude's like, I'm going to jail. Honey, but wait for me. I'll be back in eight to ten years. And say, vote for me for president, I'll be out in eight years. Uh, and a, hundred, a million people agree. He gets 913,000 votes running as the socialist president from jail. And what Harding does is, in fact, a return to normalcy. He makes sure that we back away from the world stage post-World War I. He passes the Emergency Quota Act, which I already talked about in class on Monday, of limiting immigrants to 3% of the 1910 census. That's return to normalcy. To me, normalcy means white, isolationist, big business society. Reduce immigration, he passes a new tariff. Do you guys think it'll be higher or lower? Uh, yeah, higher. there it is. All right, the Ford and McCumber tariff, you don't need to know the name of it. If you know that in the 1920s, tariffs increase, you're good. Increased tariff rates, uh, and under his presidency, there's a ton of scandals. A ton of scandals. Uh, very Grant-esque, which I had in your reading. 
uh, in that there's a bunch of corruption happening on his presidency because he's not very experienced and he doesn't know what he's doing. The one scandal I'll ask you to know is Teapot Dome. The Teapot Dome oil scandal is when his administration is basically selling off rights to oil that the national government owns to big business. So the national government owns these oil fields in the West that they're going to use for, for the Navy, for the Army, for all these things. And his administration is bribing away access to this oil. You, know, you want some oil? Kick some money this way and you're good to go. Right? So he's selling off U.S. resources that he had no right to sell, not him, his administration, um, and taking back bribes in the process. So the teapot dome oil scandal is very much like the credit mobilier scandal, very much um, like the whiskey ring, right? A grants presidency, Republican presidency, pro-business, that scandal is just happening and we're kind of just letting it go. His attorney general is being bribed by basically everybody. Everybody and their mother has bribed his attorney general in a way that's quite, quite aggressive, actually. Um, he dies. He dies in office. He has a heart attack, dies in San Francisco. And his vice president takes over Calvin Coolidge. Calvin Coolidge. Now, Calvin Coolidge, of course, like Harding, also a Republican. In 1924, we have our next election, and Calvin Coolidge wins overwhelmingly. The Democratic Party gets split because of the KKK. Some are like, just let the KKK be. Let's do this in there, helping America become great again. Um, and and uh, Calvin Coolidge wins by appealing to the economy by saying, how can you vote Democrat when it's Republicans that have given us this great economy right now? Question for you guys. When the economy's good, do we usually vote for the existing party or the other party? Always. All right, why would we change parties when the economy's going strong? And does the economy look good in the 20s? Yeah. So he's like, hey, the economy's good. It's only good because of our policies of tax cuts, of business. So what you need to do is stay with us, the Republicans. Now, an old name is back from the progressive era. Remember Robert La Follette? Yeah. What was his idea called? Uh, La Follette. <laughs> the Wisconsin idea, because he was the governor of Wisconsin, right? Super progressive. He says both these parties suck. I'm running for president as a progressive, like Teddy did in 1912. And he wins one state. Uh, his, his own state. But he does get 5 million popular votes. He just only wins one state. Lit. Lit. So Coolidge, his big, his big appeal is not the return to normalcy. He says, the business of the American people is business. It's pretty deep. It's not that deep at all. What's his, according to that quote, what is his biggest priority as president? <laughs> business. Business, business, business. And he backs it up by cutting taxes three times. Three different revenue acts, cut taxes, cut taxes, cut taxes. Now it's a cool idea because now we have more money to spend. But when we have more money to spend, what can that often lead to? Inflation. Inflation. Yeah, that there's, there's too much money in circulation, there's too much money, there's too much money, we're buying too much stuff. And under him, of course, we passed that National Origins Act, which like, finally, officially, congressionally, limits immigration for the next 40 years. What's the percentage on this one? You guys remember? 2% of what year? 1890. 1890. 1890. 1890. Yeah, 1990, exactly. The year I was three years old. Uh, 30? Yep. Yep. That's me. So I have a good card, too. That's basically where we're going to end off. Uh, take a minute as I pass out the second half of your chapter. So what's your first thing? July 14th. This is a good one. Yeah, it was your birthday. Take a look at the cartoon. Cartoon it up for me. Cartoon it up for me. All right. Yes, 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 yes. All right. Silencio, por favor. Because I have a minute left. What is this cartoon referencing? Yeah. The, the context here is all these tax cuts. Cutting taxes, cutting taxes, cutting taxes. Big business likes it. Apparently Democrats like it. Give her the gas. Tax reduction. Who's CC? Coolidge. Uh, Mellon is his, his, his finance advisor that helps with the financial policy. And the caption is important. 
Will the brakes hold? What does this cartoon imply? Will business last? Not business necessarily. Will they keep going? If business like doing too much, they go too fast. Are we going too fast? What happens if you drive a car too fast? Crash. 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 Will the brakes hold? Will the economy crash if we keep cutting taxes? I like this cartoon because it's right. It's, it, no, because it's a really good prediction. In 28, we elect Herbert Hoover on the exact same platform. The economy's so good, we're all so rich, life is great, and literally six months later, he comes to the presidency and the whole thing falls apart. <laughs> Uh, it's Martin Van, Martin Van Ruin, but time's like 30. So this is where I'll pick up tomorrow. Great job today. Thank you guys for letting me finish everything. And uh, turn in your 31 part one before you go.